about the Smart City mission and provoking us and reminding us that uh, in a country like ours where basic infrastructure is uh, lacking, we need to reconsider what smart should mean to us to have more inclusive proposals. To proceed further, I now introduce the second speaker of the session, Mr. Yes Vishwanath, who is a water conservation expert and founder and director of Biome Solutions and Rainwater Club. Thank you. That's I want the water. You right? can save some time in the introduction, but I can keep you with smartness. You know, smart city. It's been deconstructed a lot by the speakers and what's smart and what's not smart. So let's look at the city in terms of its water and sanitation and sewage and wastewater and see where the smartness actually lies. Yeah, and we deal with real life smartness, not the, the phenomenal one. So living with anarchy. The smartness is in the dark. That's what the city is. And we can always have this angst of planning, of control, of structures and regulation. But the reality is that the city like Bangalore is put on 3.5 million people in 10 years and is going to put on 5 million people in the next 10 years and so on. Because unlikely that we're going to get structured, controlled, regulated plans. So what? So how do we deal with it? That will be always a challenge. <coughs> How does it go? Where do I find those? We're putting on our water supply. No? We see the floods, we see the frost in the lakes and so on and so forth. Let's understand what the water situation is and where we're going to get water for our city. Projected demand for water in million liters per day, 2015. This is just a projection. 3,693 million liters per day. That's what we require. You know that we located 90 meters above sea level, that our water comes from 100 kilometers away and 300 meters below the city. One of the most vulnerable cities in India insofar as water goes and the one factor which will be critical in how the city grows and is livable or not. So I'm not going to get anywhere with this. I need the water a day and think of it as shortage. No internet, no smartness, no IoT is going to sort, sort it out. But common sense and knowledge and a walkabout which understand where water lies and how to bring it back to life. Now, those eight wells have been brought back to life, particularly like Munioka, and they're now being recharged also, but they continue to be perilated. So I think a lot of smartness goes with traditional livelihoods and work it around. And so what do communities do? This is Rainbow Drive, 37 acres, tank opposite the road, such a road, 360 blocks. Each one of them would have created a bore well. The bore well depths there are 900,000 feet. Each bore well costs 2 lakhs feet. 360 to 2 lakhs is 7.2 crores. 7.2 crores for 360 cross into the same coke water. Each competing with the other to empty the coke. So what do you do? You communitize the groundwater as an asset. You treat it as a common pool resource, not a private resource. You say only three straws to draw the water out. And whatever is the coke will be distributed equally. But 360 people will put back water. 360 straws to feed the coke water, three straws to draw from it. Metering and pricing. Pricing at 120 rupees a kiloliter so that you do not consume more than 20,000 liters. So that you have a cap on consumption. Recharge, wastewater treatment, you are not only water sufficient, you are water surplus, you provide to the community. Now, can we start to imagine every ward of background, the 196 wards, to be water positive? How do we architect ourselves with these kind of solutions? That's the kind of choice that we have. So, things like banning private borders. Can we control borewell trade? Can we communitize it? Shared water resources. Can we think about sharing and cooperation? And at what scale and at what unit will that sharing happen? And tariff. When the community set the tariff, it knew that the monies that came would be spent in the community itself. We have suspicion of tariff, but it goes to the government because we think it will be used inefficiently. If it goes to a private party, we think that it is making usurious profits. But if it comes back to the community as money and is reinvested in the resource, are we willing to pay more? Can we bring social equity? Those are questions before us, and it's important to understand and address the tariff question in so far as water and wastewater is concerned. Classic objects, Bajar Beta Road, behind Minakshi Temple, 78 layoffs. Look at this huge, beautiful well. They have forgotten about it. They cleaned 120 <coughs> truckloads of silt, put it on the landscape area. They didn't throw it, put it on the gardens and the landscape area. The well now has water. In these rains, the well has enough water for six to eight months. If you filter the water and treat it and use it. But unfortunately, this layout gets water from the beta phase of the at subsidized 
So how do we architect it such that more people go back to their local resort and reuse the water and therefore help in preserving the Kaveri water for others in the periphery? I think we have much more examples. If we think of this famous photograph of Ramurai, an art place, of the Sindhi body, right in the heart of the capital of India, New Delhi. Look at the waters, 88, the photograph is taken. Now, this, why? Because we built a metro station, underground, pumped out all the water, got the metro station to three stories down in the open well drive. The metro guys are there talking to the groundwater. Now we preserve it as a heritage. We do all the tuna and everything. UNESCO will come and declare it a heritage site. But what about its functionality? Do we reimagine heritage to come back functionally alive? Do we understand the root causes of the dysfunctionality and try and retrieve it? I think those are the questions that we have to ask. And look at the solution providers. Villain or hero? In 1960s, UNICEF brought 19 borewell delegates from Denmark, Great Britain, and USA to supply water when India was facing a severe drought. The Indians took it with a jugaad mentality. They did simply not drill bore wells. They made the bridge itself. And we are now the one who largest exporter of drills, drilling bridge in the world. Tiruchan <laughs> Gore, one village, Tamil Nadu small town, makes all the risks for it. 33 million bore wells in India, 250 cubic kilometers, the world's greatest and largest user of groundwater, completely a groundwater dependent society. Will we work with these drill drillers and their knowledge that they have to make sure that it's sustainable? It's in their interest and it's in our interest. So these kind of technological smartness which is coming here needs to be harnessed, leveraged and partnered if you want solutions. Look at our lakes and look at solutions. Jakkur Lake, I do not know how many of you have gone there, but you'll notice. Sewage treatment will plant 10 million liters per day, constructed by them and a lake. That's the sequence we needed. A regular functional sewage treatment plant, the community made sure that the dam can work 24 by 7 and functioned at 10 million liters per day by constantly going knocking on the doors of the institutions making sure it worked. Then what? The sludge generated in the sewage treatment plant. One truck load every two days, one ton, sells for 10,000 bucks, goes to 300 kilometers. <coughs> Are you and coconut grow with this? The sludge can pay half the electricity bill of the sewage treatment plant. Then it comes to the constructed bed tank, the treated based water. And then look at the constructed bed tank, biodiversity, beaver food, 47, 48 different kinds of birds, snakes, reptiles, mammals, everything. And nature is treatment. So that the lake is full, the pelican is there, it's got an Aadhaar card, a voter's ID card, and it will become a ward committee member if it's the relative of the corporate. We want these kind of transformations for cities which recycle treat wastewater, no froth, no foam. Fills lakes, enhances biodiversity, provides fishing as a livelihood, 130 bucks a kilometer. The big challenge for us is how can the fish pay for the electricity bill? <laughs> if you take an ecosystem approach, can I go to Bescom and pay them 10 kgs of fish a day? <laughs> Unfortunately, the money from the fish goes to the fisheries department. The bill for electricity comes from Bescom to the bigger The only thing we need is for these two to talk and to take an ecosystem approach. Now we need to institutionally architect that possibility. With that, we have sustainability, financial sustainability, technical sustainability. Our lakes are safe. Not only that, the birds are there, the wells are full. Look at this well, one lakh meters from the local well, 75 paisa a kilometer. It can provide enough water for a community of 80,000 people. This lake alone. So, can we start to think and push these things? Look at all the broad breastfeeding we do on that bed and door foam. Why don't we make a poly tunnel and make sure that it's a tourist attraction and we see the foam there instead of trying to see the foam? Can we not design which other city in the world has a foam lake for heaven's sake? And we cry and weep about it. No, let's make money out of it, you know, instead of spending money to with the national people to go to the water. What's happening to the water? And I'm not joking. That water is going into what's the river Dakshin Bilaki. Huh? And that green thing that you see, 5,000 hectares of it, is green because of the wastewater of Bangalore. That one river is very near. This foamy thing, this foamy thing, don't mourn this, celebrate this. This is all your, the clothes that you are cleaning in your homes and how clean you become as individuals. That's making the river that is picked up by farmers. This lady and her husband have invested 26 lakh rupees and have pumped the water from the Dakshin Pinakiri, 6 kilometers into that pond. Diluted with a bit of boiling water, 
from this river, which is on itself cleaned up 10 kilometers down, downstream, picked it up through wells like that on the boundary. And there are not one well, there's thousands of wells which are picking up all the wastewater. And they grow ragi. And they grow rice. And they know what the wastewater is, and they know which variety to, of rice to grow. They don't grow IR64, they grow resin. Resin, not after the resin comes from. The resin water can take this, can take the wastewater and grow strong. So there's a lot of farmer's knowledge which understands wastewater, how to use it, what to grow. Are these solutions or are they problems? Can we replace waste treatment plants with agricultural fleet? Or do we want to spend our monies on Valladolid and Varadur? Some, some of these questions that need to be asked. If we check, there is no heavy metal in the grain. It's good to eat, make good paisa. There's still foam there. And then finally it ends up in a dam called Kevar Palle. And this dam irrigates a thousand acres in Tamil Nadu. You grow excellent vegetables. You see that? And this lone guy fishing. There's so much activity and it's wastewater that we call it. So, there are many things. Have you seen this yellow trap? And this is the last idea that I want to take. 500,000 homes in Bangalore which have septic tanks and pit toilets. The pit toilets need to be empty. Vacuum scavenging is gone. The honey sucker has come. This is the honey sucker. Vacuum sucking a pit in from 200 to 300 feet away. Jugaad, again made in India. Those traps, right? They take it to the farmer's field, a compost pit, throw all the shit inside it. Sorry for the language, but that's the way it is. You're dealing with wastewater. Put it into a compost pit. 300 to 500 truck loads. Excellent manure. What do you take Sakkat power sir. That's what the farmer says. And they understand it. And then you get beautiful bananas. And grapes. So you're turning shit into wine. This is the red wine. <laughs> smart or not? Tell me. Do we need to search smartness from IBM, Cisco, I don't know where, IOT and all that? Is there not smartness here? And is this not sheer brilliance? And should we not interact with them to make it more? To deconstruct health risk, if there is any, to deconstruct environmental risk, if there is any, or if we continue to sleep like this. <laughs> As a society, we have a choice. The choice is simple, and the choice is on the ground. We need to interact with the commoners, with everybody here, and everybody is part of the solution. There are only a select band of whiners who keep whining and complaining about problems. There is a whole bunch of people who are engaging with it from a solution mode. Let's get into the solution mode. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. 
uh, to moderate the panel discussion. Yeah, abundance. Abundance in wealth, abundance in job opportunities, abundance in skill sets and is coming from all over India here now. Actually, Bangalore is a city of paucity. It's not paucity. P A U C I T Y paucity. Paucity. I'm just using that term. <laughs> and there is a paucity of many things in this place. It could be as the administration says water, power housing. But also could be paucity of large in the social equity, which Katya has pointed out, the possibility of person sensitivities and administrative deliveries, which actually came up in the morning discussion also. And a whole lot of things otherwise of implementation monitoring. So, you know, there is an interesting contrast happening in Bangalore. So, in the morning, we were discussing more about the opportunities in Bangalore. Katya said she missed out on some of the presentation. But, you know, they were you know, you, some of them are facts which you already know possibly. So, you know, oh, this can be done in Bangalore, Bangalore can be smart city, and a whole lot of discussion was going on there. And of course, there are also critiques, and we discussed about what was missing in the process. And in the afternoon session, we are suddenly realizing there's a great amount of paucity of certain things happening around here. So, it was nice to listen to Karkarini, who talked about the citizen's perspective, the human angle, and the people's aspiration issues. And I know Katya you know, for long, many years, and you continue with the same amount of passion about when you speak about people and sums and humans and citizens. And you know, there's an angle that angle is needed in the smart city. And of course, Vishwanath, you know, standing there has been, for some reason, he was just standing very silently. I said, look, this person is standing in silent sadhu. And then he says, no, something, I'll be like, hey, in the storm today, and he was, he kept up your good. The Zen waterman, Zen rain man. And you know, I think uh, I have often said this in uh, different occasions that they both deserve to be more recognized for what they have done than what they have been recognized. Uh, of course, there are politics of recognition, we don't need to that. But in my personal opinion, because I know both of them for a long time, I do continue to believe. And I wish they will continue with the passions like this for years to come. Now, what is the implication of this? The city moving in two different directions. You know, one can draw an analogy of this to what happened in the morning. Technology seemingly simplified to create comfort in life. Actually, it's very complex happening at the other level. And those who know the comfortable part of technology enjoy it, those who know the complexity part only know the complexity part. So Bangalore has this kind of a dichotomy like, of things. So in the process, many people are discussing Bangalore, we are discussing our individual realms, each one of us have our directions. And then one thing very strange, when someone is discussing smart city, they don't discuss climate change. And if we on a forum on climate change, they don't discuss about smart cities. And the, those who are discussing climate change, they don't discuss heritage conservation. Those who are discussing heritage conservation, they don't discuss about international fiscal policies. And those who are discussing international fiscal policies don't talk about the urban governance issues or whatever. You know, this kind of polarities in which we are working is not going to help much. We all claim to be experts in our subjects and we feel very happy about it, very content, and we get a good night's sleep. Someone has to wake us up. Our individual subject expertise is not going to create a great future. Are we in a position to come together? What are the systems which can bring them together? Maybe then we'll be smart. And you know, many people have attempted to look at the word smart and use it like an abbreviation. And we each one of us have our own abbreviations or our own expansions or just the MERT mind. And you know, I have actually used about two or three of them, but you know, the one latest I have said down is yes for small, small. I mean, all can guess it, of course. Young for manageable, A for appropriate, R for replicable, and T for transparent. And if you notice the real way the smart city mission statements are there, because it is not even replicable, the amount of money that even you already mentioned is like islands of prosperity. We can see what's going to happen around. If you look at, are these things appropriate 
in the larger sense, the various questions about appropriateness of smart city application, which are not pointed in his own way. Are they small? No. Actually, smart city seems to be a local intervention, but actually it has a global intention behind it. End of the week, you may think, all right, you know, on our mobile phone we'll get an information, but that one information we get would have the whole world working at it. Millions of people working at different levels. So we can go on mentioning about this in longer sense. But it is not to say we don't need smart cities. We do need, but as in the morning, some of you were possibly not there in the morning now, the scenario is that we need to work at both the levels. We need to critique it and we need